with this AP4D, the ADOC Week panel discussion, looking at values of First Nations Australians and Pacific connections. My name is Melissa Conley-Tyler, and I'm the Executive Director of AP4D, the Asia-Pacific Development, Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to Elders past and present. NAIDOC Week is all about uh, Australia's First Nations cultures, and particularly this year, the theme is honouring our elders. Nad National NAIDOC Week celebrations are held across Australia in the first week of July each year to celebrate and recognise the history, culture and achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's an opportunity for all Australians and for our international visitors to learn more about First Nations cultures and histories and celebrate the oldest continuous living cultures on earth. And if you'd like to learn more, please go to nadoc.org.au to see more about this wonderful celebration week. Now, AP4D is delighted to be holding a NADOC Week event with a superb group of speakers. So we warmly welcome uh, Australia's inaugural ambassador for First Nations people, Justin Mohammed, from Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, Office of the Pacific Gender Section, we have Jane baston Sikometi. And from the Australian Defence Force, we have Lieutenant Colonel Eileen Hall. And this will all be ably facilitated by a good friend to AP4D, Salo Dr. George Carter, who's the Director of the Pacific Institute at ANU. Now, I've introduced our speakers, but I should, I should introduce AP4D. Uh, we're still a very new organisation, and uh, I'm sure a number of the people um, on the, the call today would not be aware of the work we do. So AP4D was established uh, around two years ago now, um, and our mission is to, um, is to uh, pardon me, I now have my slides working. Our mission is to be a platform for collaboration across the different parts of Australian uh, foreign policy. So we bring together people from defence, diplomacy and development to uh, look at current problems or issues in Australian foreign policy and come up with great ideas to share with policymakers. So you may have seen some of our recent uh, papers. We've looked at everything from uh, women, peace and security in the Pacific to maritime security in Southeast Asia, particularly on issues like illegal fishing or um, on particular countries like Timor-Leste. And across all we do, we focus on this idea of using all tools of statecraft. How do you bring together defence, diplomacy, development and the other things that don't start with D to try to maximise Australia's influence and engagement in the world? Uh, you may also have seen some of the work we do to take the ideas from the experts into the broader space. Um, and we, of course, work very hard to make sure that the ideas that experts come up with uh, go into um, various policy discussions. And uh, if I may say, it's, it's delightful to see a number of the people who've been involved in our working groups in recent months on the call today. Uh, we would count our success that we see more and more that uh, from both sides of politics, you are seeing this use of all tools of statecraft language, respecting and resourcing, understanding the importance of coordinating the various parts of Australian statecraft. Uh, and we will continue to, to push that idea as much as we can. If you would like to find out more about AP4D and what we do, you can see more on our website. But honestly, I think that's enough from me. We have such a wonderful group of speakers, we want to go straight to them. So um, if I can, uh, without further ado, so um, on behalf of both AP4D and the Office of the Pacific, who we're partnering with for this event, um, introduce our fantastic panel. And I will go over to Salah, Dr. George Carter. Uh, George, if you could take it away and um, help explain a little bit more about what we're doing today. Thank you, George. Thank you, Melissa. Tulona paia malu fatalo fatu fo ila ofia malu fo lau so ifu amaua malangi ma. With utmost humility, I'd like to firstly acknowledge the elders and people of Avarua Rarotonga here in Kuki Airani or the Cook Islands, where I'm joining us today uh, for this important webinar. Moreover, in this special week of recognition, celebration, and hope, uh, I'd like to. Uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the countries and nations wherever you are. If you're in Australia, 
or through our communities across the Pacific, wherever you work uh, today. And also acknowledge our First Nations people here joining us online. Now, Avadua is a, is a spiritual land and land of connection. It's the land of two harbors here in the Cook Islands. With this natural geography of two bays, this land has seen people come and navigate uh, through as ocean navigators from Polynesia and across the Pacific, uh, who have traversed and connected these lands for thousands of years. So it's only humbling, but also with great joy that I'm joining through this connection of learning, yarning, talk talk or talanoa by online from Avadua Cook Islands. Kia ora. Uh, my name is George uh, Salara George Carter. I'm not one, but of many connections. Proud to be Samoa, but also blessed to be Samoan, Tuvalu, in Kiribati, British, and some Chinese ancestry. I'm also proud and to work and live in Nanamwal and in Gambri land, or uh, Canberra, where I'm a research fellow at the Department of Pacific Affairs, but also the director of the Pacific Institute at the Australian National University. It's a privilege to be here and learn from our esteemed panelists on ADOC Week celebrating the history, cultures, and peoples and contributions of the oldest civilization and for us, our connection. Now, as Melissa alluded to, the theme for NADOC this year is for our elders, for our elders. Now, for me, in Samoa or in the Samoan language, it translates to Oleao Amatua, the wisdom of elders. It begins a deep learning journey and the blessing of elders to breathe life into the future. It is more than just about the reflection of sacrifices, achievement challenges, or the injustices endured. But we can also say it's a call of action for respect, trust, resilience, innovation, and connection for our future generations. Through acknowledgement and deep learning from our elders, their ways of knowing we may find healing or inform a renaissance and build connections that underscore our common relationships. Now, this is very much part of my research and teaching on the Pacific, through the states and the people's engagement in international politics, whether that be in climate change, regionalism, or geopolitics. I've come to find that much of this engagement and decision-making is beyond the transactional, economic, political, or strategic interest of a state equally paramount in the formation and implementation of Pacific state foreign policies is the intrinsic balance, interplay, and the role of culture. Again, it underscores world, island worldviews in maintaining its relationships. Relationality in international relations recognize the importance of ongoing relationships by peoples, actors, and in international spaces. The processes in terms of relations in motion as ontologically significant and not only recognize the material capabilities, but also the perceptions, positionality, practices, and norms of Indigenous people. One way in which I am part of a community of researchers from across the Pacific, including First Nations, Aboriginal, and Torres Strait Islands, we are unpacking a relationality through the study of diplomacy, a body of work which we call oceanic diplomacy. We have defined diplomacy more broadly to be the social institution existing between not just the modern state, but moreover political communities. This includes Asian civilizations, inter-island and tribal exchanges of communities over seascapes across the ocean and of communities of landscapes through mountains and desert communities. These systems past and present have managed and governed interactions through them on such matters such as trade, exchange, sacred events, access to resources, movement of people, conflict resolution, reconciliation, and the conduct of war and its aftermath. Ocean diplomacy explores the practices that allow and maintain relationships across the most diverse communities of the Pacific Ocean continent and a diverse with over 250 nations of the original and Torres Strait Island nations in the land continent. Seen in this way, diplomacy is first and foremost a culture that exists between communities, 
a set of rules and norms that shape or manage interactions between these political communities. We find that these alternative ways remain relevant and important in today in what we call diplomatic pathways. These diplomatic pathways had informed and guide societies, not just for the last 50 years since the modern state came about for more specific alienations, but for thousands and tens of thousands of years. The customs and practices and values, they are not necessarily written in books, but enshrined in our artwork, passed down orally through our chants and storylines and breathed into the life, breathed into life by the wisdom of elders. Now in celebration of NADOC week, we explore Australia's First Nations approach to foreign policy in the Pacific by focusing on indigenous values, underpinning connections with our region. Today, our panel will focus on cultural values of First Nations and how they connect with the Pacific. We shall explore this through engagement across 3Ds or international relations, diplomacy, development and defense. It's now my pleasure to pass on to our panel members to introduce themselves. Ambassador Justin Mohammed, Jane Paston Sikimeti, and Lieutenant Colonel um, Colonel Eileen Hall um, for their story of connection and how their work and how values have guided their work uh, through diplomacy, development, and defense. Um, I yield the floor to Ambassador Mohammed. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. And um, I'd just like to also acknowledge traditional owners of the lands which we're all meeting on and pay my respects to elders both past and present. I'm here on the uh, Ngambri uh, um, Ngunnawal lands here um, at a balmy seven degrees. So I'm sure many of you may be um, coming from warmer places, but so glad to be here with you. Um, as mentioned, I'm the ambassador for First Nations people in Australia. Um, my name's Justin Mohammed. I'm Grand Garang from Queensland, um, but in the last uh, more later years of my life, I've been living down here in the south of uh, Australia in ACT and Victoria um, collectively. So the role of that I have as a First Nations um, ambassador, um, this is an inaugural position in Australia. And from what I can understand and speaking to um, other countries and their um, delegates, um, it seems to be the first of its kind in the world. So the role that we have here is really to embed First Nations perspectives into Australia's policies, as you can see. Um, this is a role which has been appointed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And in our landscape that we have here in Australia, it's the very first time that this type of position has been appointed from a Minister of Foreign Affairs. So very new in the space of the international engagement. The role that we have is, is very much about the first, but making sure that our First Nations perspectives, our values, and our very long history of diplomacy can be reflected in across all our foreign policies, which is again, going to be a task, a new task, but a challenge which everyone here is really looking forward to, to doing. In saying that, um, this role itself is to, it is to increase our First Nations people here in Australia of our connections with the rest of the world globally, but very importantly in the Pacific, and how we can have First Nation dialogue, but to bring bring and connect and to rebirth, I could say, those hundreds and sometimes in some cases, thousands of years of connections that our forefathers and mothers have had between our countries, to include that now into our work that we're doing in this contemporary world that we live in, in 2023, and looking at the many issues that face us here in the Pacific and also globally. And as Indigenous peoples, um, progressing the rights and interests of those globally. What I wanted to do, kind of continue to speak about is for the examples that we have and to be able to move forward with this is that the way that we've been working with this in this country, as we always do, and from my background, engaging with the community here in Australia across the many many diverse nations that we have here across our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to um, we've been embarking on getting to know what is happening here in our own backyard, the experience, perspectives and interest, and to build that and bring that into the, the ingredients of what we need to then move into our foreign policies to ensure that when we engage with other countries and 
our neighbouring countries here in the Pacific, that we can really truly bring our First Nations perspectives into those conversations, not only into the conversations, it'll be at the heart of what we do and our inter um, inter um, interconnection with each other on international areas. And that is um, part of our engagement is not just through our gen our peak bodies or representative bodies, they, they, they are very important, but is to speak with, as you can see in this picture here, some of our most youngest members of our communities to our most senior and our elders, which NADOC Week is, um, is acknowledging um, their, their tireless work as our, with our elders and everyone in between that to ensure that we can bring the diversity that we have as First Nations people to the rest of the world and to your country into the Pacific as we kind of embark on how we can bring our knowledges, our traditions and our values and our, our expertise to these very global issues that we face and that we're dealing with together. So some of the areas which we are going to embark on in this case, obviously areas of trade and climate, um, human rights, gender, health and justice is just some of the few which we're working through. But we are really doing this not as this office, as First Nations Engagement Office, and my role won't be the only part of where the Australian government, but it's, in, it's, it's here to ensure the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade that our whole department takes a First Nations approach in one working with in the Pacific, but in broader than the Pacific, and ensuring that we promote our First Nations rights globally, and we do that in a First Nations way of using the, the, the many, many years of expertise that we have to address those issues that I've mentioned. So with that, I won't leave it at that and be happy to answer questions, but thank you so much for the opportunity here today. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to try and see if uh, Lieutenant Colonel Eileen's online. Um, if you can hear us. Uh, Yalada. Um, yeah. Uh, Yalada. Uh, oh, can I can? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I. <laughs> Uh, Yalada, uh, Nai Ningadil Island, Nai Agari Bubu Gujinga UA, Ningada Bubu Wangamon, East Cape York. So, um, for those listening in and dialing in, uh, my country on my mother's side is not where I'm currently situated. Uh, I'm currently dialing in from Larrakia Nation, uh, from Darwin. Uh, on my mother's side, uh, my people are from East Cape York, West Cape York. Uh, I have family connections to Purama, which is in the Torres Strait. Uh, uh, my father was an Irish immigrant. Uh, so for like many of you, uh, when we talk around connections and, and especially personal connections, uh, many of us have had to code switch for many years or learn to walk between two worlds. Uh, and so that's been uh, my journey. I'm currently... Uh, the inaugural in inaugural position whereby I'm the first uh, command cultural advisor. So I cover 52% of Australia's landmass. So 51st Battalion in the east that goes up to the uh, PNG border um, across to North Force, which covers Northern Territory and Kimberley area, and then Pilbara Regiment, which covers the other part of Western Australia. So it's about 52% of Australia's landmass. Um, within my role, I'm the conduit between command and on ground and government. Um, so some of the challenges is not really challenges, it's actually understanding connection and culture and understanding how culture can enhance capability. Um, I'm not too sure if the slide deck is up for me. Is that one up? It yes, is. yes it is. We yeah, have seen the images. Okay, so the first first slide that you have there, this is my personal history and it's really important in my role to understand history. These are family for me. So the two elder, the, the elders in the background there, that's my grandmother's parents. So uh, in a Western way, you would say great grandmother, great grandfather, culture way for me, that is my daughter and son. Uh, it's, uh, it's a different lens. So even if I can't have children, 
um, or grandchildren, I can still learn how to be an elder because we take on those responsibilities for looking after. So in this photo, this was taken um, uh, in a place called, it was called Cape Bedford. Uh, and then in 1942, as a, because of um, issues with World War II, Cape Bedford people were removed from Cape Bedford and moved inland into an area called Warrabinda in 1942. So imagine going from hot sunny climate, going inland to cold climate. Um, and so when we're talking around um, people and movement, we've also got to understand that um, part of culture is understanding our history and how that can impact on um, people of today. And so the second slide uh, is, is actually showing I'm in this slide, I'm the little fair skin one in the left hand corner. So in a Western way where you have first cousins, um, so the, the children in the photo besides me are my mother's first cousins, um, but culture way for me, these are my mothers and fathers. And so when we're looking at relationality, it's also understanding how kinship comes into play because that impacts on how we do negotiations, how we do community engagement. The third slide and the fourth slide is the importance of story because story anchors us to a time, a place, a space. So in English, when we say, hello, how are you? Culture way for some of our areas is, um, where are you? Are you here now in this time, this space, this place? Because if you spiritually aren't here, but physically here, then the time is wrong. Your mind is not here. So the negotiations that we would have would be superficial because you're not here physically, spiritually, the time, the space may not be right. And so one of the things we've been talking about, particularly now when we're doing joint exercises, say with um, American or Indonesian or Japanese or our Pacific Island brothers and sisters, is understanding their anchors, culture anchors, what connects them, you know, what are our shared histories. And so the slide that you come to where it's got the map uh, on the left-hand side of Europe and then of Australia, the left-hand side, Western way, they're very familiar of a map of Europe. They know that these are different countries. But when we talk about, for example, in our Australian landscape, we have many nations, um, many cultures, uh, but we also have shared history and shared um, relationships with our Pacific brothers and sisters. And so it's really important understanding how culture and story connects us. They provide us those cultural corridors. One of the other thing when we go to the um, sixth slide, is that one up? I can't see. Yeah, yes, it is yeah, um, yeah. on Casa on and Kimberley. Yo. So um, this one talks about, uh, we have a lot of history. Uh, this photo, particularly of this young uh, young man, was take, was found in a, a, a box belonging to an Italian anthropologist uh, from 1812. And so trade connected us. It also produced uh, interfamilia connections. And so one of the things I've been working on is around the importance of language. And so we have over 250 major language groups across our area of operations. We have 800 different uh, dialects. But what's been interesting is particularly around trade, uh, for example, like in Nyulungamata, especially Western Nyulungamata, the red flag dance, that connects us with our um, Indonesian brothers and sisters because of that link. They had their own language for trade. They had their own language for um, doing business on country, whether it's on country or sea country. And so that's a corridor, that's a connection point. That's a mosaic that we can use when we're starting to look at development and engagement. The other thing, uh, it, it's, an, it's an amazing, amazing story. And the more we come to understand that, especially around trade routes, you know, sometimes government sort of tends to say, hey, we've, we're doing new dialogue when really we've had hundreds and hundreds of years uh, of, you know, culture dialogue, you know, that's been sort of beneath the surface happening. And so it's sort of providing that light in that space. Um, when we go into the next slide, especially around how relationship 
works. And I like this one because it explains my father being Western from Ireland. He only had small bit family. And then when he came and linked in and married my mother, uh, he had sort of had adopted all this big mob family. And uh, it, it, it got a bit funny. So I like that slide because it sort of highlights particularly for for some of our First Nation mob um, is understanding the strength of relationship. And that leads into the last slide is you might not have blood ties to an area, but culture connects you in other ways. And so it's really important we understand that culture can enhance and build and strengthen capability, but we can't do that unless we understand the relationship and culture and language provides that. It's everything. The other thing I would put to you all is um, the work that we've been doing is also understanding how, how important it is around culture safety because you can't begin negotiations, you can't do engagement on country or with other spaces unless you provide a culturally safe space for those, um, you know, right way talking to happen. Uh, and so language is really important and key. And I'll talk a little bit later about what some of the work we've been doing um, uh, with our uh, other brothers and sisters around connecting and using culture as a way to connect them into our um, relationship circle. I hope that made sense. Hello, Fafta. Thank you very much, Eileen, for uh, your sharing. I'll hand over to uh, Jane. Uh, thank you, Jane. Thank you. Good morning. There have been acknowledgements of country this morning, but following on from Aileen, um, language is really important. And so I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country in Ngunnawal language. And I thank the Ngunnawal teachers and elders who share their language to enable us to speak and hear it today. Dora Nuna, Dora Ngunnawal. Yangu Nalawiri Dunimanyan. Ngunnawal Wari, Dawrawari. Nangida Dindi. Wangarili Jinyin. This is Ngunnawal country. Today we are meeting together on Ngunnawal country and we acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders. Now I'm on Ngunnawal and, and Ngambri country and, and so to are many of you, but I acknowledge that we are meeting together from across Australia and from across the Pacific. And I pay my respect to the custodians of the lands and the seas of our region. I acknowledge the great diversity of Indigenous cultures and lands from within Australia and also across the Pacific. But at the same time as diversity, we also have one soul water, a term I first heard in PNG, so one ocean, one soul water. This week, NAIDOC week is about celebrating the history, the culture and the achievement of First Nations Australians. So I need to thank Namba elders and community who taught me so much early in my career. Uh, so I worked in Brewarrina in northwest New South Wales early on in my career. Um, and they taught me so much about the strength of community, a family uh, and inclusive governance. So I wanted to pay respect to that um, teaching that has really taught me and informed the way that I've gone about my work since. A little bit about me. I'm an Australian woman of Pacific heritage. So my father met my mother when he migrated to Australia in the 70s from Tonga. And I grew up in Western Sydney in Darug country. You might be wondering why I'm on the panel today. I, I wondered that myself. I think I'm, I'm the D for development following um, our Ambassador Mohammed and Lieutenant um, Colonel Eileen. Uh, I'm very aware that I'm not a First Nations uh, Australian person. I come to the panel today to learn. So I'm really keen to learn from our ambassador and from Lieutenant uh, Colonel Eileen Hall, from you, Salah George Carter, and from our partnership with A4PD. So I come today to the panel in the spirit of dialogue, of Talanoa and a yarn, and to celebrate the strengths and achievements of First Nations Australians this week on NATO Week. So I'll share some examples with you of connections between First Nations and Pacific peoples that I'm aware of in the work that I do in the Office of the Pacific. Uh, and they're connections that make our policy and program work stronger and more effective. 
But very, um, just before I start those examples, I'd like to give a big shout out to my colleagues in the Indigenous Peoples and Culture section in the branch that I work in, in the Office of the Pacific, the Pacific Development Branch. So big shout out to Emi Tagi, Mitchell Gonda, Carlo Tafolo, Devlin McClarty and Julianne Cowley. Thank you for all the work that you do. My first two examples relate to gender work. So late last year, the first meeting of the Pacific Women Lead Governance Board was held. This is a governance board that gives strategic direction to a program called Pacific Women Lead. It's a regional program that has the aim that Pacific women and girls in all their diversity are safe and share equitably in resources and opportunities with men and boys. And at that board meeting, it was held in Fiji, in actually, I think it was Nandi, not Suva, but Australia was represented by the Assistant Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Malandiri McCarthy. Senator McCarthy introduced herself to the meeting in Yanua language, um, her language and talked about her country and highlighted her connections um, to people as saltwater people. It was a really meaningful connection and the meeting led to an invitation for a First Nations Australian to join the Pacific Women Lead Governance Board, which would enable two-way dialogue and learning on Indigenous experiences in relation to women's leadership, women's rights and governance through the board experience itself. So the process for appointing a First Nations person to the board is currently underway and we have really meaningful connections to look forward to as that appointment um, comes into place and the board continues its important work. Another example is that Senator Malandiri McCarthy led Australia's delegation to CSW, the Commission on the Status of Women. So it was a meeting held in New York at the beginning of the year. I think it might be one of the largest gatherings in New York other than the United Nations General Assembly Leaders Week. And at CSW, Australia and New Zealand were able to support the Pacific with new language for CSW on the significance of sea and maritime and climate change. The significance of Senator McCarthy representing Australia as a First Nations woman in the region and globally was really appreciated by Pacific partners. I think the significance of that representation was really um, noted. My next example that I just wanted to touch on is the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent. So it's a Pacific Island Forum strategy document. And Australia is committed to this document. And it, when we read it, I think it's really important that we read it as members of the forum. We're not reading it about the Pacific, that's about Pacific Island countries out there, but we read it from a perspective and think about what it means for us in Australia. And it highlights the importance of cultural values in all the pillars. So including the people-centered development pillar. Uh, and when we read the value statement from an Australian perspective that we treasure the diversity and heritage of the Pacific, and we seek an inclusive future in which our faiths, cultural values and traditional knowledge are respected, honored and protected I think about the opportunity that we have with um, our ambassador for First Nations, his office and a First Nations foreign policy to make much stronger connections between traditional knowledge and cultural values between Australia and the Pacific. And my final example, I guess, is an expression of that um, valuing traditional knowledge and it's in relation to disaster risk resilience. So both in Australia and the Pacific, this is a critical issue. Uh, there was a disaster risk resilience conference hosted in Brisbane last year in 2022 and there were really strong examples of practice shared there from both Australia and across the Pacific. First Nations people have supported disaster prevention, migration, uh, sorry, mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery mechanisms over generations. And in particular, evidence shows that Indigenous knowledge, cultural practices and local expertise uh, really provide early warning and enable early action for communities facing natural hazards. And just finally, I, I challenge us all to think about the strength that Indigenous knowledge and perspectives can bring to the work that we do in the sectors that we work in um, to bring about improved outcomes. Thank you, Malo. Thank you very much, uh, Jean, for, for your sharing.
Now, before I sort of ask the next question, I'd also like to um, invite um, uh, the, um, people joining uh, on our webcast live. Uh, so feel free to ask questions uh, in the question and answer um, a box within the Zoom uh, at the bottom of the page. Uh, you know, as we lead into, we are open to uh, your questions as well, not just the conversation or the telenor amongst us. Um, and so in all your three reflections, uh, you've um, alluded to some of the work and engagement uh, that your um, department or your particular office is uh, conducting at the moment in terms of uh, working with the Pacific. Um, and as you all alluded to, uh, there are certain values, especially in, in an area where working with the Pacific and such as the Blue Pacific uh, strategy, uh, strategy on the Blue Pacific continent, it's the importance of values. I'd like to uh, hear from you and your reflections on what are some of these values that have come through, uh, through your engagement that also is uh, connected to some of the values of First Nations that you are aware of. Maybe I'll, uh, we'll start with Eileen and uh, Jane and then Ambassador. Uh, Yalada, I am, um, for, for, I guess if, say for example, if we're talking around climate adaptation, so my previous role before I took on this role, I was a CEO for um, my community council uh, at Wujo And in 2016, we noticed that there was significant changes happening on country. Yeah. And so we didn't have the, the necessary resources to understand you know, from a Western way how to articulate that. So what we tried to look at was understanding how we could put together our strategy. And I guess the, the thing that was really an interesting component for us was around talking around the, the story around legacy and also one of obligation and authority. So when we as a council and as a community and talking with our elders, we spoke about the need to look at that generational approach to planning. And that's something that you know comes in very loud and clear particularly when you're looking at your 2050 strategy for the blue pacific is around that generational lens so even though funding or or development aid sometimes has a cycle of three or four or five years when we're in that space as first nation peoples it's that generational lens so we're thinking three five seven nine generations out so it's really important, whatever programs or projects or services or, or, or infrastructure that we're looking at, it has to have that impact investment. So if I take $20,000 today to, to build a, you know, a particular shed or something like that, am I gonna see the impact of that investment in, in three, five, seven, nine generations time? Well, the answer is gonna be no. And so that really made us sit up as a as a as a mob in terms of talking about back to government, well, hey, these are the things that we find important because um, culture for us in terms of looking after country is if I don't do right by country, it not only affects me the person, it affects my whole bloodline, and so that's a huge cultural responsibility, and so it really changed in terms of the questions that we asked and what we wanted to focus on. It also made us a bit more bolder in terms of repurposing a lot of our technology. And that's something that I was really excited about when reading the strategy is around the, the innovation that you're looking at in terms of getting you know, data sovereignty, getting the right technology. Um, for us, it was um, one of the things we did was repurpose our water wastewater collection tools, the SCADA network. So instead of getting point in time data around water wastewater, we repurposed it. So we created a network, a Wi-Fi net dome um, which is the first that we'd ever done. And it's and usually innovation isn't something that First Nation people are sort of noted for at that time in, in Australia. So we were really challenging a lot of the cultural bias or unconscious bias, which wasn't really so unconscious. So I guess in my then when I took that on in my current role, it was really thinking about, well, what is the generational approach to engagement here? 
and that's really understanding what is the story for these areas that we're working with, but also the connections not only within Australia, but also with our overseas brothers and sisters and being really careful and understanding, um, listening with respect, speaking with respect, making sure the actions are respectful, but most importantly, doing no harm to their story and what their aspirations are generationally. That's something we've been looking at and also around um, understanding how trauma interplays with conversations. Because if a lot of um, First Nation mobs still have a lot of unfinished, what we call unfinished business, and you can't move ahead unless you deal with the unfinished business first. Um, and so creating those culturally safe spaces for fearless and frank conversations to happen, that was part of the learning, particularly in my role, but also taking my non-Indigenous brothers and sisters on that journey when they're working with First Nation mob is not to be afraid of having those fearless and frank conversations. I think I'll pause there and let Sister talk. Thank you. Uh, yeah, look, building on that, I, I'm reflecting on conversations that we've had in relation to um, gender equality with the region. And I think one of the messages that we've heard is how important uh, it is for Australia to acknowledge and recognise, I guess, the context. Um, you know, so when we're having dialogue, when we're talking to um, Pacific regional counterparts or in the different country contexts, that we really acknowledge that the context of the discussion, which makes me think about the conversation that we'd had earlier around sort of place, so the importance of, you know, where people are at, either from a particular country or a particular community or the region. So really um, valuing context, I think the, the context that um, we're engaging with people on. and. The other one that I think is really key is um, in relation to sort of reciprocity and relationships. I think the importance of of relationships, and as um, Eileen talked about, I think that that longer term view of relationships, I think, is really key. So they're two of the things I've taken taken away around values. Thanks. Um. Thank you for both. I agree with everything that everyone has said. It's um, fantastic. Um, but my, my contribution to this um, question, I I think um, we're in a very unique time um, in the world globally. But for First Nations people, for Indigenous peoples, we've um, find, I think we've got a very strong opportunity to be able to enhance what's valuable to us to the rest of the world. And this comes from where we are with climate and climate change. And as I've heard, and I'm sure that you've heard this saying, but as First Nations people, as Indigenous people, we've contributed least to the issues that we have around climate change, but we're going to be impacted the most by the, you know, by, by climate. Um, and we've all had, um, in where, where we've lived, um, one of the things we've had is these deep rooted connections to our lands, our waterways, um, the environment that's around us. and. I think um, now the world is needing answers and we need to do take action. We as um, Indigenous peoples, as First Nations peoples, that our expertise and how we do this collectively is going to be something which we can, um, we, we can showcase, but also um, show to the world of how we can manoeuvre through this very difficult time. And that's through the way that we relate to each other as First Nations people. Our, our connection, our respect, our mutual respect, our understanding, how we bring that to the forefront of all conversations, of all, all negotiations to protect our, um, you know, protect our biodiversity, the issues that we are you know, trying to combat with change and our traditional and our um, ways that we've been able to maintain a connection to land and our waterways over, over generations that we're able to bring that now to the forefront. So um, how we do this, I think, is, is very much what we know in, innately in ourselves, how we communicate with our families, our, our communities, but now bringing that to a world stage or to a, a global conversation. Um, no more, I don't think, that we need to park our traditional cultural practices at the outside of boardrooms. We should be bringing them into those. I think the world is ready for that because they can't hold on to and celebrate our diversity without ensuring that we have that diversity inside those 
meetings and in our policies and and in those really government to government people to people conversations and that's something which I know the Australian government is really looking to move forward and bringing that to the forefront and that will take I think um, those strong relationships that we have and connections to our what we've been brought up on and what we've been taught through generations now we'll be able to bring that into our conversations and our um, very strong dialogue that we have about addressing in this case um, climate change, but also these other key areas that we have spoken about and the other spe speakers have spoken about before around, um, uh, which I've mentioned in their um, presentations as well. Thank you very much. Um, I, I thoroughly um, enjoyed uh, uh, your reflections of uh, uh, all um, uh, the importance of values and the lessons of values from the engagement. Uh, we have a couple of questions um, from um, uh, people joining the webinar. And I'd like to uh, pose uh, two of them right now and, um, you know, leave up to uh, the panel to answer which ones or answer both uh, that, uh, you know, links to some of your work, but also your views. Um, one, you know, is something that's common to all of us, that uh, despite our value uh, or recognition of all of the indigenous knowledges, whether Samoan, Tuvalu knowledge, or um, the nation of First Nations that you're from, we still exist in a world where um, it may not be uh, valued, um, and that uh, it sustains a, a status quo that uh, sees us fighting within such a system. So how can, I guess the question that's asked is how can we, if not break, how can we value our system or allow our indigenous or traditional knowledge um, elevate or empower us in this uh, in, in such a, a system? Uh, the second is a question. Um, um, sorry, and then I'd like to acknowledge that was from Na uh, Navanita. Second question is from uh, Jay Caldwell, um, and I, this I think. Oh, sorry, this is specific to the ambassador. Is uh, do you think Australia does or can take a generational view to engagement with Pacific partners? So the question is about a generational view to engagement with Pacific partners. And I open that uh, to our, um, our panel. If you want, um, I'll speak to the last question because <laughs> before I forget it, uh, but I'll speak to the last question. Um, I think definitely Australia can, um, you know, have we done it in the past? Have we done it well? Um, that probably an answer is no. Um, there's a lot of improvement and room for that. However, I think that we've got an opportunity to do that now. Um, and I think that um, as Australia to see itself as part of the Pacific, it is here. I think in the past, Australia, um, I'm saying this from my perspective and being in this role for just on three months, but in international affairs, Australia's probably seen more about moving in to support or provide assistance or to resolve an issue in, in, um, in our, especially in the Pacific, Indo-Pacific regions. However, now we're in this space that I think we're saying, okay, well, if we're gonna bring First Nations perspectives into that, positions like mine that I have now as an ambassador, well, we need to change the way we do that. And the generational connection through this won't be just for my moment in the time that I'll have this role. But what I do now, and this is where, where I'm kind of bringing my, my um, traditional knowledges and what I've been brought up with and guided with, is that what we, the platform we, we start now with will be there for the next generations to build up upon that. But also we don't make sure, we, and, and making sure that we have, we, we provide the space for the generations to come onto this and be able to have the conversations and to bring their, their knowledges and new ways of learning to connection with our um, traditional life knowledges. So the answer, the short answer is yes, but the key thing I'll leave you with, wherever we are and whatever roles we have, and I've got this challenge to myself, I'm not pointing the finger, I'm pointing the fingers back here and here at myself, is that when we have these roles or we get put into a position, especially around First Nations or Indigenous, and we have a voice. My challenge to myself, and I'm challenging everyone else, is that let's make sure we don't just follow the suit and try to build it in within the square of this westernized system, that if they want us to be a part of stuff, 
they they accept all of us and we bring that change into the structures into our policies but also the way we do our meetings and how we take our time to make sure we build those relationships and that's something that you know, it's not easy but I think the more that we do that collectively and we're starting to see that that um generations will be able to walk in there and be able to move far move in a fast um a more speedier way because we've laid those foundations and paved those ways to change the westernized ways of doing diplomacy to bring it back more closer to our ancient ways which is still so much relevant um, and probably more relevant than ever before as we've talked about the issues that we've got in, in front of us too and challenges in front of us in the pacific to deal with so i'll leave it at that I'm happy to jump in on um, Navanita's question. It's a really good one, and I think it's one that we constantly need to ask ourselves around how do we keep changing the status quo. Um, two, two kind of um, quick responses, because I'm really conscious of Eileen having an opportunity to respond, but I think um, the diversity of our kind of workforce and who we're engaging with, I think is critical. So from a DFAT perspective and Australian government perspective, the diversity of our workforce, I think, brings um, the opportunities for us to have different perspectives and viewpoints um, to challenge the status quo. So I think that's one thing that we need to do that's really important. Um, and the other thing I think that that you that the question um, talks a little bit, you know, about what, what patterns do we need to change? What do we need to do differently? I think um, it comes down to sort of who, who we're accountable to as well. And I think um, that that's critical. I think if we sort of follow traditional models of accountability, um, perhaps we're a little bit more limited in, in the, the policies and program responses that we take. But if we have a broader um, sense of accountability and governance, I think with the region that we're working in, with the Pacific, um, with First Nations and Indigenous peoples, then I think hopefully that will keep us challenging. But it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing um, process, I think, that we have to make, have to be open to. Um, and so, you know, the examples that I gave earlier, you know, when we're not there yet, it's, a, it's an ongoing process and we need to keep challenging ourselves um, and, and being accountable as, as government, as policy and program deliverers. Thanks. Uh, Yalida, it's Eileen. Uh, I think one of the things that I learned from my mother's side uh, is around the adaptability that First Nation people have. So if we look across the last millennia, we've had to adapt very quickly to change. And so that adaptability is innate in all of us. So when we put that towards a negotiation sort of stage, I guess, you know, one of the big things that I've learned over the years is you can only move at the speed of trust. And so if we're talking about introducing new ways, um, particularly if they're entrenched and um, embedded in foundations of culture, it's important for First Nation people's voices uh, to be heard, uh, and you can only do that at the, the, you know, moving at the speed of trust. And so, one of the things that um, you know I'm really conscious of, and I guess I reflect back to work back in, you know, my own community, is around sometimes you just gotta, sometimes you just gotta really challenge what is the values that we're wanting to work with, and understanding that sometimes when we make decisions that we're not in that survivor mentality either. Uh, sometimes we're pushed into a corner to make decisions on the spot and whether they're the best decisions or not at the time, we have to understand that that's part of understanding what our own behaviours and I guess picking up on what Sister said. So for me, the values is, you know, this is the framework. I'm really, um, that 2050 vision that you have, that's pretty much laying out this is our values, this is where we're heading. And if people and governments and that value what Pacific Voices are saying, then they will support that in whatever way that they can. Uh, the challenge is for all of us is around that adaptability piece. And so if our systems are clunky, then our systems need to adjust. We don't have time to waste 
things are happening, particularly with regards to climate, and we all have to join together as one. And I, I think about the story, particularly around leadership that we use in saltwater country, is around the crocodile story. Wherever the head will go, the body will follow. And the head isn't just representative of one person, it's that collective knowledge. And so that's important that the collective knowledge is allowed to share, is allowed to understand together, because otherwise we're all going to miss out. The other story we talk about for leadership is the stingray story. And so um, when the stingray is threatened, the tail will come over with the barb to protect the head and the body. So what that tells us for leadership is it, you don't have to be the lead person. We all have a role to play in terms of protecting the body. No, one body, many parts. And so it's important that we understand that as part of, um, you know, whether, you know, laying the foundations around values, you know, when we're negotiating, particularly laying the foundations for generational approaches. It's good questions. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've come to the last three minutes, but uh, I do acknowledge there's some very important questions that have come through and there's many more coming through it only underscores the fact that uh, we have uh, we need to continue this dialogue and open the, this dialogue for more but uh, if i'd like to i'd like to invite ambassador to hopefully wrap up the session before we hand over back to melissa if you could uh, make a response in terms of these two questions because i think they're very very important and it's very much part of his work is in terms of the uh, foreign uh, policy uh, uh, discussions, how do we manage vast diversity of Australian foreign national um, communities, making too many asks um, for our communities? But at the same time, it's another how question is, how can we better support uh, a very diverse group of uh, diverse diplomats coming through this time uh, in Australia? And how do we better support these professionals? and uh, sort of to wrap us up and before handing it back to Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, George, for that. Um, I'm going to probably keep this very simple, but I always kind of look at um, what hasn't been done or what we haven't included in the mix um, when we're looking to try to resolve or to improve something or to um, correct something that's happened. And one of the things that hasn't been in the um, in that mix or in the plan or in those um, in in this work around our for, foreign diplomacy in this modern era has been the Australian First Nations people. Um, this is one of the departments and the minister. This is one of the areas that Australia has um, or the Australian First Nations people haven't been a part of the structure. It's been done that they've had international engagement, but usually outside of the government structure. So I think now, and I'm not just saying it because I'm the ambassador of First Nations people and the structure is starting to take shape, but I think the having First Nations people, not only people, but our ways of doing in this space um, and the guidance. So we can internally know what we all know as indigenous people, the, the pressure and the expectation from governments and external bodies wanting to know and pulling, you know, pulling us from pillar to post about responding and, and consulting and researching and all the rest of it. But to bringing that back to say what is important for us as First Nations people, as Indigenous people, and having that um, within the fabric and within the machinery, if I can call it that, our First Nations people in Australia, our Torres Strait Islander, our Aboriginal people, as part of the mechanism and, and how far we push and how far we pull back when do we be when do we lead when we walk beside when do we walk behind to to um you know our work that we do across the pacific and with our brothers and sisters and in, in doing that um i think that's the part that has been missing in a lot of our the dialogue and the work that's happened in the, across this area over the over the past decades um so bringing that back to the forefront is what my answer would be um, in doing so and you know when doing that we may make mistakes um, but progress um, in this area and it's not recreate it's not creating something new it's regenerating what we've always had in the Pacific but bringing that into this new world that we live in now that bringing that back into and having those guiding points again and um, 
I think the other part, which I've, I'll finish with this, but our sharing of stories across those waterways, um, whenever we sit with any Indigenous people, we connect more than we do disconnect, right? Um, and bringing that back to the table. So the challenges that we face here at Australia, the power challenges you, that are faced in the countries which we are working in, we bring them back to the table and say how we work those together and those understandings. And I think that's one of the parts, the missing ingredients, the missing part of our foreign diplomacy over many decades now. And we're, we're at this point of time that we want to bring that back into the centre and to the heart of what we're doing. So I'll finish with that. Thank you so much for to all of you, to uh, Ambassador, to Lieutenant Colonel, to Jane, to Salah George, um, for sharing your stories today. Uh, I wanted to, to thank everyone on the team who made this possible. So for the DFAT, Office of the Pacific and First Nations Peoples teams, um, to AP4D team, uh, particularly Tom Barber and Heather Rathel, thank you. Um, and of course, thank you to everybody who joined us today. Uh, this is a record crowd and I think it shows, you know, just how much interest there is in learning more, in connecting more, in understanding this important topic. Uh, so if you would like to be part of more discussions like this, please do follow AP4D uh, on social, sign up for our newsletter on the website. Please stay in contact so we can keep this conversation going. And if I can say again that it has been such an honour to be able to celebrate NAIDOC Week with this superb discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>